I'd like to do now is, I assume we have microphones that can travel around. I can't really see out there. Um, but I've seen a few people who would like to get into this conversation. Are there microphones in the audience? Uh, do we have someone with a microphone? Anyone? Well, is that, is that Jim? Yeah. I, I can't see. OK, the microphone is coming. Why don't you wait? Identify yourself, please, before uh, posing your question uh, yes, to the My camp. name's uh, uh, Don Johnston. Uh -huh. <coughs> and I was, I, I've met most of you formerly, but I was Secretary General of the OECD. But look, I have three points I'd like to ask you about. Uh, <coughs> Can you hear? That's better. On? That's better. Is it on? Yes. <coughs> One is Trump might learn. I mean, it's hard to believe that he might learn. But remember Arthur Vandenberg, who was the senator from Michigan, who was a staunch protectionist before the war, and finally ended up when he saw the advantages of the United States, for example, that the Marshall Plan would bring by having a strong United Europe rebuilt. He voted for it. He re representation at the UN. He became essentially, he made a very famous speech of contrition in 1945. That's a possibility. Uh, I'd like to hear some of the comments on that. Because the fact is that 20 years ago, we were all talking trade, not aid. We all thought that the developing world, the poor countries, would be brought in through the WTO process, which I think Trump would like now to dismantle. I mean, he's an American first guy. He seems to believe that it's better to be an 800-pound gorilla you know, in the ring with one other smaller gorilla, which is why he likes bilateral agreements. Even with, and after, think of what he did there. He separated Canada and Mexico out of the, in the, in the negotiations, which was an example of, uh, of, his, of his strategy. Went to Mexico first, then came back uh, to Canada. Well, that's, that's one issue I have that I'd like your view on. But you know, Kamal Dervish made a point about the technology. This is extremely important, but for the United States, I'm reading every day almost about a lack of skill bases in the United States in engineering and sciences. There are 350,000 students from China studying in the United States, and Trump was even considering stopping their visas because he thinks they're stealing you know, ideas back again. But there's a, a dearth of, of, of skills in, in, in many of our Western countries. And finally, just one other point about the saying that, the, that, that, they, that you have to have the United States. The European, I think the Europeans have a big role play to play here. If you can get the European Customs Union to really act with one voice, it's the largest market there's ever been. And, and uh, I don't think that's impossible. I think that the threat of Trumpism might ha actually bring that about. So you'd have another gorilla. Now, does anybody agree with that or disagree <laughs> with it? <laughs> well, the, the I think the first question is, let's broaden it out a little bit. Uh, can Trump learn is the way you put it, I think. But the broader question is, can American policy change under the current administration. Mark, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Well, anyone else, but Mark in particular, since you've I, thought I mean, about honestly, this. Honestly, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think he, I mean, this is one of the few things he seems to actually believe. And he's, I mean, if I were to say that there could be possibility of change, the way I would put it is this. Donald Trump got elected president without ever holding public office and without ever running an organization with more than 300 people. So he was uniquely ill-suited to be president of the United States. We have a system, which I'm not defending, I'm just saying this is the way it works, in which the president of the United States appoints about 3,000 political appointees. The Trump administration was very slow to get off the mark in terms of making those appointments and getting them confirmed. Normal American administration takes six months to a year to kind of shake out because you have people who worked on the campaign, you have people who worked in the transition, you have people who are now getting appointed. They have their own ideas, they have their own agendas, they have their own personal ambitions. So everyone's kind of scrambling and there's a kind of winnowing process where ideas get discarded, individuals get discarded, and the, the, the government kind of converges on a line this Trump administration has been very slow to do that. 
So you could say that there's still an unusually high level of internal disagreement and that the upshot of these internal disagreements could be shifts in policy or, or shifts in personnel that would then manifest in shifts in policy towards a more constructive direction. But I'm quite, personally, I'm quite skeptical that that will happen. Other thoughts either on Trump's evolution or not, or on the technological or European issues? I mean, Come I on. Don't, I don't think the Trump administration can change or President Trump can change. That, that's a different statement from U.S. changing. Or I think the young people in the U.S. The cities, the more dynamic parts of the country are, are all ready for, for change. But I do believe, and you know, it's kind of repeating the third time, the, the, but, but I think it's really very important, that the, pr the productive sphere is changing. What is a monopoly is changing. And it is not in the direction of a more equal income distribution, more, uh, more equitable kind of mm -hmm. society. And that, that is partly why Trump, Trump won. So I think what needs to be addressed is not just the uh, multilateralism or the re relationship with China, but what needs to be addressed really is how is humanity going to manage these new technologies? And here, again, in the end, I think, I'm, I'm not American-born, the U.S. will take the lead. Thoughts? Go ahead. Yes. Mm, not on Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, well, I think the economic consequences of uh, so-called Trumpism may start to affect uh, ordinary people pretty, uh, 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 sooner than many people uh, expect. And so uh, that may affect uh, the, the uh, Trump uh, economic policy to some extent. And, uh, uh, after this midterm election, I don't know what would be the outcome, but, uh, but uh, uh, Trump will have to uh, make effort to get, you know, if he's interested in uh, run for a second term. And so the economics may uh, affect, uh, may drive uh, the policy changes, uh, hopefully. Uh, but as uh, Mark pointed out, but I don't think there'll be very uh, significant uh, changes given social political dynamics existing in the U.S. and all of the world. Right. I don't, right. That's why I'm more concerned about more really uh, Kinderberger uh, uh, type of a situation right. where no enough leadership, not enough public, global public goods are provided. And so what that means is that at each individual country level, particularly in emerging world, will have to make uh, extraordinary efforts uh, in terms of educational reform and strengthening social safety net and, 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 and so forth. So I think the educational reform is the main thing. Uh, that, again, is very difficult, but that, again, has a lot to do with the income distribution uh, for the future as well. And you mentioned that, uh, you rightly mentioned that uh, uh, China, of course, East Asia as a whole benefited uh, the most from the uh, uh, post-World War II, um, the uh, liberal economic order. So uh, Asian countries, including China, should be uh, uh, ready to share the burden of providing public goods. It's not, it's not just providing international leadership as such, but I think opening up your own market and implementing your structural adjustment is one way sharing the burden of, uh, for the global world. Either, yes. Yeah, it's a challenge. CSIS in Washington, D.C. Uh, had a seminar, I guess, a couple of weeks ago invite all of the former representative uh, USTR uh, to uh, share their idea. The moderator asked the first question. He said, uh, don't criticize the current policy. I just ask you, do you think these tendencies will continue 
go out or you think it's just temp temporarily. I saw two or three of them, several of them say, they say, we don't know. We don't know. So I think the same question uh, uh, many times. I think it's dependent uh, in which level. Uh, in some uh, issue, I do think Trump administration wouldn't change. Some idea he just stick. Yeah, some idea he hold uh, 30 years ago, even very much long, he still stick to that. Mm -hmm. But some issue he may change his mind, particularly maybe at the end of next year or 2020, uh, US economy get a suffering. I don't think he will continue to do everything now. He may want to do something, want to negotiate with China. That's well, my well certainly, whatever the goals of the administration or Trump himself may be, facing difficulties on the domestic economic or political front or technological change or internationally could force a change in government policy. There's no question about that. I want to move to, I think, what will be our last question since we need to move to the second panel. If you could identify yourself and then yeah. ask your question. Uh, Philippe Chalma from uh, Paris Dauphine University. My question will be uh, quite uh, uh, easy not to answer but to uh, <laughs> present. Uh, are we ready and can we cope with the next financial crisis? I mean, in 2008, we had a crisis coming from the US and the subprime problem, but it was fairly easy to just have a recession and not a depression with old Keynesian policies, uh, you lower your interest rates and you float the economy with uh, liquidities and quantitative easing and the rest. Just right now, we have a huge problem of debt. Our public deficits in many countries are fairly high, 4% in the states. So if we had a new financial crisis coming from where, I don't know, perhaps students loan in the states or something else, could we cope? with a financial crisis, which would be not only perhaps a recession, but eventually a depression? Um, I think that's a, an extraordinarily important and good question. I would disagree with the notion that it was easy to confront the crisis in 2008, 2009. I think many of us were surprised at how successful the cooperation was and expected things to go much worse. But I suppose we can turn again to the panel and ask if we are, in fact, prepared for whatever the next crisis may look like, which we don't know. But Kemal? Well, I think, I, as one says very often, the crisis never quite looked the same as they were in the past. Uh, the, the high level of debt, per se, I don't think is, is, a, is too worrisome. What is worrisome is the composition of debt and who owes how much to whom. Um, but I believe that in the near future, at least, we won't have another edition of a 2008 crisis. We will have some other crises, which we may not foresee right now. But I, don't, I, I think the, uh, the financial sector has learned, also for its own benefit, of course, it does some of the same things again. But I, I don't think we will get a re-edition of the 2008 crisis. Mm -hmm. And to total debt. One well, has to remember sure. is, is, you know, it, it's always debt from somebody to somebody. So <laughs> it, it all depends on who owes what to whom. Sure. Mark? Um, I, I think that uh, the questioner correctly identifies the problem that we have very low interest rates and a lot of debt. So we don't have a lot of space to respond, although I would defer to others um, who know more about that than I do. But in terms of this session, what I think is really striking to me is that we are getting this level of political polarization and populism under relatively good macroeconomic circumstances. If we were to get a financial crisis in the United States or other big countries, and there really was a significant downturn, one, one uh, hates to think about how that might manifest politically. If anything, the last few years have, have made me reassess my beliefs about human nature. It, it, views appear to be much more fluid than I would have expected. It is incredible to see polling data in the United States that now shows 
a large majority of Republican-affiliated voters regard Vladimir Putin, a former KGB colonel, as a good guy. And Trump is so polarizing that the support for free trade, despite what I said at the beginning, <laughs> support for free trade is now higher among Democrat-affiliated voters Twice as high. than it is among Republicans. And I think we are in a truly dangerous situation. And the interaction of that degree of political polarization and fluidity with a real financial crisis could be very, very dangerous indeed. Uh, after 2008 uh, global financial crisis, we all know that uh, financial institutions, banks are better capitalized and are sounder now. But that doesn't mean that uh, future crisis uh, will not happen, uh, occur. Uh, as I uh, 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 alluded to during my initial uh, uh, the remarks, uh, I think uh, there is more likelihood of having a uh, financial crisis, uh, small or uh, big, already happening in uh, some countries now uh, in, 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 in next uh, two or three years' time. Not five years, maybe next time. So to prevent that or to help uh, remedy the situation, I think this uh, international cooperation is, again, is very important. I mean, theoretically, but what will happen is it's a different uh, issue, but we have to make an effort. And the, uh, uh, for example, very simple, swap arrangement. I've been mean, always saying the swap arrangement is least costly because the bigger the arrangement, bilaterally or plurilaterally, the lower probability of utilizing it. So it's a costless insurance. And so this kind of uh, arrangement can be done among central banks. And so there are ways of uh, uh, dealing with this uh, uh, the, uh, uh, possible crisis. Many people point to Chinese financial conditions as one of the more worrisome components of the international scene. Where, does, where do things look like from your perspective? Yeah, I, I guess um, um, after all the break of global financial crisis, the international community have already done lots. Uh, for example, set up a G20, FSB, a global financial safety net, uh, at the center. But it's still hard uh, to identify uh, which way or uh, when the financial crisis will uh, broke out. But what I'm concerned is maybe it happened do not due to one single fact, maybe some overlapping fact. For example, in uh, 2020, uh, the U.S. Uh, economy coming down, the Chinese uh, economy coming down, that will create a very dangerous situation. A financial crisis will be out. Also, uh, if escalation, a uh, trade war between U.S. and China, cannot be uh, resolved soon, it, it will drag on our whole uh, global economy. That something factor overlapping, uh, which will pro provide some uh, environment for occurrence of financial crisis. It's undoubtedly true. Well, I saw dozens of hands up, and I'm very sorry that we can't take, not even all, any more questions, because we do need to move on to our second session. I will point out that this is only the first, ses first plenary session of the day, and there are other sessions coming up. There are also side sessions, one of which I should promote because it's on finance, specifically for those of you interested in these issues. We do need to move on. We'll take a very short break, not even a break from your standpoint, only a break in order to transfer the four on the panel to the next four. So thank you all for your participation, and we'll move on. <laughs>